Hi, I am Amy Cooper. I am a professor in the Department of English and Fine Arts at the US Air Force Academy. I specialize in 16th and 17th century literature, and I very often teach the Shakespeare survey. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about meta theater in Shakespearean drama. Before launching into what the word meta theater means, I wanted to first give you a brief outline. So the first thing I'll talk about is what we mean by the word drama, what the word theater means. Not everyone has been to a theater, so I wanna make sure that we have a shared understanding of the um, situation that we're talking about. Uh, then I'll go over a couple definitions of the term meta theater. I'll give you a narrow definition and then a broader definition. Then we'll go over the significance. Why focus on a term like meta theater? What does it help us do when we read drama? I'll go over a couple of examples um, and I'm gonna pull my examples from the Shakespeare play, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Some of you might be familiar with it. Some of you might not, that's okay. I'll fill you in on some of the details about the play. And then I'll close with a thesis. I wanna give you an example of what a thesis statement might look like for someone who was, um, you know, studying meta theater in a play like A Midsummer Night's Dream. So first, we should talk a little bit about what we mean by drama or theater. Uh, more specifically, how is drama different from novels, poems, or short stories? The biggest difference is that when you pick up a play and you read it, that play is a script for what most, what is intended to be in most cases, a live performance. So one way to think of it is that um, theater and drama, they're, they're more like your experience of film or television maybe than your experience of novels, just because it's supposed to sort of give, give rise to a live performance, right? With actors in front of you. Um, why is this important? This is important because when we read drama, we need to recreate in our imaginations what it might be like to be in a theater watching actors performing the script that we're looking at. When I teach, when I introduce students to this, often the example I give them is um, The Office. I don't know if you've um, seen a TV show like that. It doesn't have to be The Office. It can be whatever your favorite comedy show is. But imagine um, only getting the script, right, that the actors used when they were performing, you know, the TV show. So much happens when an actor is performing that doesn't get recorded in the script, right? So as you read drama, um, one of the things you can always ask yourself is what might this have looked like when it was being performed by actors? Um, and, it, you know, the flip side of that is imagine uh, take your favorite TV show, imagine reading just the dialogue from it. There's so much that would get lost, right? So when we read drama, um, we should be using our imaginations to kind of recreate what it might have been like on the stage. That's our background. So now, um, if that's what theater and drama are, what is meta theater? So I'm gonna give you two definitions here. The first one is a kind of narrower or more limited definition. Um, meta theater refers to any instance of a play that is performed within a play. So we're gonna see a very clear example of that from A Midsummer Night's Dream. There's a broader way to understand meta theater though. Um, and this broader sense of meta theater refers to any instance in a play where there is a reference to some aspect of dramatic performance. So you don't have to have an actual play staged within the play. That would be the narrower definition. Uh, meta theater also includes references to acting, references to theater, references to performing in some kind of way. So those are the two ways that you're most likely to see this term used. Okay, so we kind of have to back up and I think it's always important to ask, why do we learn to identify specific literary forms or devices or techniques in general, right? In literature class, why are you asked to be able to, to learn the vocabulary and be able to identify it when you're reading? I wanna suggest that there are kind of roughly two reasons why it's valuable to learn the vocabulary in this case of, um, of meta theater, right? 
Um, it's important to learn the vocabulary of literary analysis in part because when we have the vocabulary to describe what it is that we're seeing when we read, it means that we're gonna better understand what we're reading, right? Our vocabulary improves our understanding of the text. The other reason you could say, and this is kind of related, is that when we better understand the text, we're able to describe it in finer detail when we have a more enriched vocabulary for the way that we talk about literature, we're gonna get better, we're gonna just be better at making interesting analytic arguments about what we're reading. So in other words, and I say this to my students all the time, um, we don't learn the vocabulary for the sake of learning the vocabulary, right? We don't learn to identify these literary devices because that's an end in itself. We do it as a means to an end. Um, we, we learn the vocabulary because it gives us a much more fine grained um, you know, analysis of the text when we have the words to describe what it is that we're seeing. The kind of follow-up question to that would be, why pay attention to this literary device? Why meta theater um, specifically? Meta theater, I want to suggest to you, is an important tool of analysis because it is a reflection on the art form that it appears in. In other words, you can think of instances of meta theater as the artist holding up a mirror to their own play, right? Um, and what we see in that mirror, what we learn by uh, you know, focusing in on these instances where the play is showing us something about how plays work, right? Um, what we see in that mirror will vary from text to text. That's why it's so important to have specific examples. So meta theater is important because it is a reflection of the art form in which it appears. Why might that be of value? Um, what we're doing when we focus on those moments is we're getting some kind of insight into the way the artist is thinking in that moment about their own art form. I don't want to suggest that we're getting access to an author's intent or their kind of um, their personal beliefs or their mind in some way. That's not what I'm saying. Um, we'll never really have access to Shakespeare's intent for Shakespeare's mind who died like more than 400 years ago, right? Instead, the way to think about it is that um, analyzing instances of meta theater allow us to think with the artist about the art form that is being represented in this kind of reflexive way, right? I think that that's a really interesting sort of um, experience and one that's worth paying attention to as a reader. All right. So that's, we've got our definition. I've given you some reasons why I think the term meta theater is valuable as a term of analysis. The rubber hits the road though, when we look at specific examples, we're not really gonna understand the term, why it might be valuable until we begin to use it in relation to a specific literary passage. So what I've done is I've pulled several passages out of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream this play, if you haven't read it, highly recommend. It is fun, it is fantastical, it has fairies. There are four uh, youths that fall in love with one another and they get lost in the forest. Um, it's just a super fun play. Uh, what I'm gonna focus on is not the fairies or the lovers. Instead, I'm going to focus initially on what we might call the rude mechanicals. That's what one of the other characters in the play calls them. These are uh, low plot comic characters, you could say. Um, the rude mechanicals are essentially day laborers. That's what that term means, rude mechanical. It means that they're day laborers. So their, uh, their day job is in carpentry or in weaving or in metalworking. One of them is like a bellows mender, right? Um, so these guys have full-time jobs. They're not professional actors, um, but they, well, and I should say too that like, their, their little subplot in the play is fun because they're, they're kind of bumbling and they get involved in all kinds of antics and they're supposed to be um, a source of humor or comedy for the audience. Um, the moment that we're gonna drop into here, and I'll read this quotation in just a moment, we are looking at act three, and this is where we see these characters um, talking about how they're gonna put on a play. 
In other words, this is the setup that Shakespeare gives us for the play within the play that happens in Act Five, for those of you who are familiar with the play. So in this moment, the characters are rehearsing their play. They're trying to figure out, like, how do you put a play on? Like, what, you know, how does a play work? Um, how do you get the audience to think that what they're watching is real, right? Um, because they're not professional actors, because they're amateurs, um, they have to sort out these questions. The, and then in terms of the play as a whole, what they're doing is they're rehearsing a play that they're going to perform for Duke Theseus, uh, the Duke of Athens, which is where they live, the Duke is getting married. So that's the kind of situation, that's who these characters are, the play within the play is going to come, it's actually going to get performed in Act 5, we're just looking at a rehearsal scene in Act 3. Um, so one of the things that they also are talking about, we'll get into this in a little bit more detail. So they're talking about how you put on a play, but they're also asking like, what happens if we're so successful at putting this play on that the audience forgets that it's not real? What if we bring a lion out and it scares everybody, right? Um, so to a certain extent, the way to understand the scene is that Shakespeare is kind of making fun of these characters. Um, for A, not understanding how a play works, um, and then B, thinking that they'll be so good, they'll be such good actors that they're going to scare the audience because, uh, because one of the characters has to play the part of the lion. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I'm going to read this passage with you, and then we're going to pause and kind of analyze what's happening in it. So these are the three characters. We've got Quince, Snout, and Bottom. These are three of the rude mechanicals. Um, and we're kind of dropping into the middle of the dialogue here. And Quint says, then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber. For Pyramus and Thisbe says the story did talk through the chink of a wall. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Some man or other must present wall and let him have some plaster or some loam or some rough cast about him to signify wall and let him hold his fingers thus, and through the cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. Okay, so, so this is the moment of dialogue where Quint, Snout, and Bottom are trying to figure out how they're gonna stage the play. And the big dilemma that they've identified is that they don't know how they're going to have a wall, right? The wall is like really important to the plot of the play, Pyramus and Thisbe, that they're gonna put on because the wall has a chink in it that the two lovers talk to one another through. Um, what they're doing in this moment is kind of hilarious because they're so incompetent. Um, they're worried. The script says that there's a wall. How are they gonna get the audience to understand it? How are we gonna do this, right? Snout says, you can never bring in a wall. Part of the reason that we, the audience, are laughing at this moment is because we know how staging works. Right? Imagine you are in the audience of the theater. You are watching these actors pretend to be actors, right? Rehearsing a stage play. In other words, what we're watching is a play that has effectively used staging and props, right? Um, to create the effect or the illusion that we're watching, you know, a story. Um, but in the midst of watching these very competent actors put on this play, we're watching actors play the part of incompetent actors, right? So in other words, what we have is um, some humor because we know how the setting and staging works because we're actually watching it. Um, but these guys are kind of bumbling around trying to figure out how to put on a play. How are they going to get the audience to understand what a wall is, right? How are they going to represent it? Um, so the payoff or takeaway, okay, so that's the kind of setup. The payoff or takeaway of this scene the payoff or takeaway of observing when we see a play within the play happening um, is that the, this moment is dramatizing the boundary, we could say, between fiction and reality in theater. It dramatizes, in other words, for comical effect, the, um, the strange experience that actually does happen in theater when we have real emotional reactions to what we're watching, right? So, on the one hand, these characters are pointing out how difficult it is to represent something in such a way that the audience is going to understand what they're looking at. Um, paradoxically, what they're calling attention to is the fact that we don't need to be told when a wall is a wall because audiences know um, how to decode the representation. 
In fact, if you've ever been to a movie theater, right? Uh, if you've ever been to watch like a scary movie, uh, at a jump scare, sometimes everyone in the theater will like scream all at the same time, right? Um, there are these moments where an audience gets lost or absorbed in the fiction that they're watching, right? So on the one hand, these characters are worried that the audience won't understand what they're looking at. And they feel like they have to kind of interpret the play for the audience. On the flip side, though, one of the things that they're calling attention to is the ways in which audiences do get very deeply absorbed into, into a performance when they're watching it, right? So Midsummer Night's Dream, I want to suggest, is kind of preoccupied with this phenomenon. Um, the, the experience that an audience has when they're in the theater of um, at once getting absorbed into the world of the fiction and yet also always being kind of simultaneously aware of the fact that they're in a theater watching a play. Right, they know that what they're watching isn't real. Um, and yet we get absorbed into the fiction. We can have real emotional responses to the thing that we're watching. To a certain extent, that's what this scene is dramatizing. It's calling our attention to the tools and techniques of theatrical representation in order to kind of call uh, the artifice of the theatrical experience um, to our attention so that it becomes more visible to us. That boundary between fiction and reality becomes a kind of bright one that we're suddenly more aware of because we're watching these characters talk about it. Okay, so the next part, the next passage I wanna kind of um, go over with you. I've shown you the rehearsal, now I wanna show you the moment that they're describing when it actually gets performed in Act Five. So this is still the same example because we're just looking at the rude mechanicals, this play within the play. But I've taken you now to a passage from Act 5, Scene 1. And at this point, the, the characters that we just saw, Snout, Bottom, Quince, and the other group mechanicals, they have um, <clears throat> been called to the stage, they're ready to perform, and they're putting on the play for Duke Theseus uh, for the wedding celebration. And at this point, actually, through you know, various ups and downs and twists and turns, there are four, four weddings that they're celebrating, so many weddings. But that's what this play is for. So they're getting ready to come out on stage. And they each of the characters gets to come out and kind of describe who they are. Because remember, they were worried both that the audience wouldn't understand how theater works, and that if someone came out dressed as wall, the audience might not understand that that character represents a wall, right? Um, and on the flip side of that, they were also worried that the audience might get so absorbed in their, in their play. They would be such good actors that the audience would need to be reminded um, that not to worry, this wall is not a real wall. This wall is actually just an actor, right? So the, the, both of those kind of aspects of the play are, are operating in this moment. And so, um, the, so as you can see, the script that I'm, uh, the, the play text that I'm working with says wall. Um, so this is the character who comes out and plays well, and this is what the actor says, right? In this same interlude, it doth befall that I, one snout by name, present a wall. And such a wall as I would have you think that had in it a crannied hole or chink through which the lovers, Pyramus and Thisbe, did whisper often, very secretly. This loam, this rough cast, and this stone doth show that I am that same wall, the truth is so. All right, I love this passage. It's like, I can't, I can't get through the whole thing without laughing at it a little bit. So, <clears throat> so this was Snout, and remember, I'm just gonna flip back. Remember, this is the character, Snout, who says, you can never bring in a wall. He's totally incredulous that a wall could be staged um, in a theater, like during a play, right? So here he is, Snout, dressed as a wall. Um, you know, Bottom suggested that, well, if we, if we put some like, rough cast and loam on him, which are the materials that you would use to build a wall in the period, right, and some stones, like that'll signify wall, right? And so Snout comes out and he says, um, he's like, he's like, okay, I'm Snout, but as you can see, I am dressed as a wall, therefore I am a wall, right? I mean, that's like essentially what's happening here. So uh, we see kind of that rehearsal process this is the kind of result of it, which is that the, the actors have decided that they're gonna come out and interpret the play for their audience. Um, 
you know, so we, the audience, uh, you know, we're kind of laughing because of course we recognize that he's a wall. He's dressed like a wall, right? Um, what I want to suggest, and I kind of already said this, but I just kind of want to reinforce the reason why I'm going over the rehearsal and why we're now looking at the moment of performance is because I want you to see the ways in which this play within a play is calling our attention, we the audience watching the Midsummer Night's Dream. And remember, it's kind of complicated. It's like nested dolls, right? We are in the audience of the theater watching Midsummer Night's Dream, but we're watching the audience within the play, right? The character Duke Theseus and all of the other characters in the audience, we are watching them watch a play. So there are these layers that are happening, right? So we talk about a play within a play, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, that layering of different levels of embeddedness within the, fact, within the fiction, what that does is it calls our attention to where that boundary between our space as the audience, the, the space of like the, the reality we could say, or like the world that we live in, and then the space of the fiction, the space of the play, the space of the stage, right? That boundary becomes um, highlighted in certain ways. It, re it gets reinforced whenever we have a character inside a play calling attention to the techniques of representation and the techniques of performance that actors really do use when they're performing a play, okay? What I wanna do now, so that's our, that's our example of the narrow definition of meta theater. Now what I wanna do is give you example number two. This is a slightly different example. This also comes from act five, but it's a completely different character. This is Duke Theseus, the person who gets married and watches the play as part of the celebration of his marriage, right? Duke Theseus um, is kind of an interesting character because he's like the voice of reason. He's a ruler. So when he speaks, it has the authority of law. Um, at the very beginning of act five, um, and this is the passage that I've given you here, and I'm gonna read it to you in just a sec. What he's doing here, this is a very different moment in the play. He's talking to Hippolyta, his fiance, who he's about to get married to. He's saying to her, like, these stories that these other characters are telling us are fantastical, right? Um, I just don't believe these fanciful stories. Um, and as he's saying that, he actually kind of transitions and he starts talking about poetry, right? Which is kind of weird. Like, what's happening there? Um, I want to preface this. I'll, I'll read the passage, but I want to preface this by saying that the word poet here might mean something slightly different than what you're used to. So when Shakespeare was writing, um, the word poet was kind of expansive, and they often would describe playwrights as dramatic poets. So Theseus is going to talk about poets here, but I want you to imagine not just poets, but also playwrights, um, authors of literature, of, of you know, fictional or kind of um, fantastical literature writ large, okay? So this is what Theseus says about the poet. The poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Such tricks hath strong imagination that if it would apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed a bear? Okay, so this speech is kind of interesting. I'm gonna point out a couple things about it. So Theseus is essentially saying, you don't, you know, let me preface this by saying, you don't have to understand every word when you look at a passage. I always encourage my students to focus on what they do understand, what does make sense. And once you can find that thing that makes sense, it's easier to build out your understanding of the rest of the passage. I know Shakespeare can be very difficult for students because it's such a kind of um, archaic, uh, you know, way of using English, right? It's not exactly how we use English anymore. It doesn't sound like modern English. Um, but so what he's saying here is that the poet um, the poet's imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown. Um, and if we're thinking about theater in this moment, and we're not thinking about lyric poetry on the page, what one way to kind of understand what he's describing here is the way that a playwright will body forth the characters from his imagination 
when an actor plays that character, right? So playwright in their imagination, they imagine the character, they create the character, they record the character's lines in the script. That character, which comes from their imagination, gets literally bodied forth in the body of an actor who performs that part, right? So the poet's imagination bodies forth the, the forms of things unknown. That's what the imagination does. The pen, right? So once the, once the playwright has kind of imagined the characters of the play, the pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. So an airy nothing here is that character, because remember the characters don't really exist. They exist only in the realm of the fiction and the fiction doesn't have any kind of material presence until the moment of its performance. And then the moment that the performance is over, they're gone, right? They're, they are airy nothings. These characters um, like Duke Theseus, like the rude mechanicals, like the fairies in the play. Um, what the poet does to those airy nothings, though, is he gives them a kind of material reality. He gives them a local habitation and a name. What? Okay, okay. So I'm going to pause here and say there's a dramatic irony that, that I think makes this passage really fun and really interesting to think about. Because what Theseus doesn't realize as he's describing this is that he is himself an airy nothing, right? Theseus is a character that only exists in this play, right? He has been given a local habitation, the setting of the play, which is Athens, and he's been given the name Theseus. What Theseus doesn't recognize is that he's a character in a play um, and that all of these statements he's making about how insubstantial plays are, or poems, right? Dramatic poetry, as it would have been called in this period, Right, um, so it's it's insubstantial, it's not real, is what he's saying here, right? They're, they're airy nothings that are bodied forth from the imagination. They're, they don't actually exist, right? He doesn't realize that he's actually undercutting his own existence, he's describing himself. So what I wanna suggest is that this is a moment of meta-theatricality, right, meta-theater, um, because Theseus is describing um, the process of a playwright, right? It's, it's in, that vein, in the vein of that broader definition, this is a moment of a character reflecting back on the art of theater. But Shakespeare has added a twist here, essentially, by making that character kind of um, the, the butt of a joke, right? We in the audience, we know that Theseus is an airy nothing. He's been given a local habitation and a name. But Theseus is not in on the joke. He doesn't get that he's actually, um, you know, talking about himself here, right? Okay, so we've gone through our examples. I've given you an example of the narrow definition of meta theater, a play within a play. I've now walked you through a sort of second example that, um, you know, exemplifies the broader definition of meta theater. Any kind of reference within a play to theater, acting, that sort of thing. What I wanna do now is give you an example of what we would do with all of these insights that we've just generated about meta theater and the places where it appears in A Midsummer Night's Dream. So I'm gonna close this uh, video with a thesis statement. Here we go. So if I were writing an essay, I would argue in A Midsummer Night's Dream, the performance of Pyramus and Thisbe is an example of meta theater. This play within a play reinforces the distinction between fiction and reality by calling the audience's attention to the tools that actors use to create the world of the fiction. Theseus's airy nothing speech, while also an instance of meta theater, complicates any easy distinction between fiction and reality that the play otherwise tends to reinforce. Whether it is used to reinforce or to complicate the distinction between fiction and reality, instances of meta theater call an audience's attention to the artifice of theater itself. Okay, so in other words, what I would argue here is that meta theater, if I were to kind of summarize this or explain it a little bit, meta theater appears in at least two places in this play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, 
And what meta theater is doing in these two examples is slightly different. In one example, the stage uh, act three, you know, rehearsal scene with the rude mechanicals, in that case, meta theater is being used to, to reinforce that boundary between fiction and reality by calling our attention to it. I want to argue, though, that meta theater in the um, Act 5, Scene 1, Airy Nothing speech is doing something slightly different. That there, because we have a character not fully recognizing that he is a character in a play, part of what he's doing there is kind of blurring that line between fiction and reality that seems so clear earlier in Act 3. So what meta theatricality does, I would say, given that it can be used in these two very different ways, what it does is it calls our attention as an audience to the artifice of theater, the, the ways in which theater as a kind of mechanism, the way that, the way that it works, right? The fact that it is a, a crafted or created artifact. Um, okay, so I think that's where I will end things. I want to um, wish you very good luck in your class. This year, I hope you are enjoying the literature that you're reading. I myself actually took the literature, the AP literature exam many years ago, uh, back in high school. And so um, it was a really good experience. I hope you guys are learning a lot, enjoying what you're learning. I hope this video was helpful to you. Um, good luck. <laughs>